Welcome to Meals for Maturity, Bible talks to help you mature as a follower of Jesus, by Pastor Dom Fiocco. Famous Irish rock band U2, who most likely will one day be forgotten by the next generation, well they have a song called The Wanderer. I wonder if you've heard it. It's a rare song by U2 because Bono doesn't sing it. Instead they outsource it to Johnny Cash to sing. This is the lyrics. I went out walking through the streets paved with gold, lifted some stones, saw some skin and bones of a city without a soul. I went out walking under an atomic sky where the ground won't turn and the rain it burns like the tears when I said goodbye. Yeah, I went with nothing, nothing but the thought of you. I went wandering. I went out in search of experience to taste and to touch and to feel as much as a man can before he repents. Now Bono tells us in his autobiography that the song The Wanderer was inspired by his reading of Ecclesiastes chapters 1 and 2. He says, It's a story of intellectual wanderlust, a story of a wanderer trying everything his eyes, ears, tastes, feelings can grasp at. Welcome to a song, in, in fact part of the Bible, where we read of this mad binge of self-centeredness, where life revolves around me and what I can do and what I can experience. Welcome to Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verses 1 to 11 where the wanderer or the teacher in Ecclesiastes becomes the ultimate hedonist. That is a hedonist is all about making his personal happiness the chief end uh, or goal of his life. It's a life lived to the full, life to the max. A hedonist uh, has an ideal of minimizing sorrow and maximizing joy uh, without reference to God. All with the aim, of course, to find meaning and purpose and satisfaction in life while we have air to breathe in our lungs under the sun. What we should find amazing about this 3,000-year-old book uh, called Ecclesiastes in our Bible uh, is that it reads like a page out of a modern publication today, like a Time magazine or a Sports Illustrated or Money magazine or Fortune 500 or Tech Invest. In just a few lines, we're about to hear timeless truths that apply just as well, that they are just as relevant as they were to ancient Israelite society. So pick up your pickled pomegranates, grab your glass of glistening Red Sea water, and let's travel back in time on the Wisdom Highway, east of Eden, and let's hear an ancient teacher speak a modern word to you and me. No matter where you're living or what you're doing, or what generation you identify with, based on the speed you can type a text message to your best friend who you've never met, but you like their Instagram page. Now you might recall chapter 1, the last couple of Bible talks. The teacher, probably King Solomon, is trying to find answers to the meaning of life. Where to find satisfaction from this short life that we all seem to live, some shorter than others. He's doing a series of life experiments, because he can, because he's filthy rich, he's got plenty of time, he's had lots of life experience. And so he's asking the big questions of life that we all ask at some point in our life, if we're honest. Is there anything in the world that can truly satisfy the longings of the human heart? Why is life worth living? Is there any purpose to these days on earth? We saw last time that he goes on this great search for the meaning of life, the universe and everything by filling his head with knowledge, with human wisdom from all sorts of disciplines by enrolling in the great universities of the world. Now surely someone with a university medal from Oxford, a Nobel Prize for Literature, a PhD from Cambridge, an MA from Harvard and wearing a, UN, a uni hoodie from ANU, surely they should, with all their intellect and great learning and academic letters after their name, surely they should be able to work out the meaning and purpose of life. Surely the size of their brain and university debt should qualify them to give us the best answer. But no, instead we soon learn that chasing after human intellect to find satisfaction and meaning to life leaves you puffing and panting like an exhausted greyhound after chasing a mechanical fur ball around a racetrack. Or, in the words of Ecclesiastes chapters 1, verse 14 and 17, chasing after the wind. I love this line from Alistair Begg, 
a faithful American pastor. He writes, there's a tremendous amount of education and there's a dreadful lack of wisdom. Until we have the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, we can never really create a curriculum for sensible education. Well, from chapter 1, verse 12, through to the end of chapter 2, verse 26, the teacher takes us on uh, various life experiments. So next up on his journey, I'm going to seek and search, he says, for answers to life, its meaning and purpose. I'm going to do that by chasing after pleasure. Maybe this will provide him and us with satisfaction under the sun. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 and verse 8. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself, but behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. Verse 8 I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. Now right at the start of chapter 2 verse 1, we already know his findings, his conclusion. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself, but behold, this also was vanity, havel, vapour, bubbles of nothing, meaninglessness. He concludes by verse 1, the pleasure does not satisfy his soul any more than human wisdom does. The teacher says to us, let's imagine you can have all the pleasures in this world, something that most Aussies dream would be the perfect life lived out on the endless long weekends. He says, as king over Israel, as top dog in the land, I can enjoy everything, indulge myself. Every pleasure is mine for the taking. Surely this will bring me satisfaction, purpose, meaning to life. And so the teacher goes down this path. He's a man who lives life to the full and chases after all kinds of pleasure on offer. Specifically in this passage, wine, women and song. Wine, verses 3 and 4, as much as he wants. This guy has a wine cellar that never dries up. The stacked shells of Dan Murphy, of Liquorland, of the vineyards of Tasmania, they can't match this guy's wine catalogue. Women, he says, verse 8, a concubine, or abundant breasts, is actually the literal translation, a crude reference to as many women as he wanted. Across all generations and time, sex is a pleasure chased after by men and women. But few people ever experience a sex adventure on quite the grand scale that King Solomon does. 1 Kings chapter 11 verse 3, we get the raw statistics. 700 wives and princesses with 300 concubines. That's more sexual partners than anyone could ever imagine. Solomon is the true playboy king in his palace of pleasure, so he thinks. The teacher should have, uh, should have got the podcast of Martin Luther many centuries later. and He should have listened when Martin Luther says, If the Lord has given one a wife, one should now hold on to her and enjoy her. If you want to exceed these limits and add uh, to this gift which you have in the present, you will get great grief and sorrow instead of pleasure. Now, of course, at this point in Old Testament history, King Solomon has rejected the one woman, one man biblical standard set up by God and later affirmed by the Lord Jesus. So he says, I'm going to seek out the pleasure, wine, women, song, verse 8, whenever he wanted, this endless playlist on his eye device, live music at the clap of his hands, pop stars to sing at his kids' birthday parties, supermodels to prance on the dance floors. I don't know if you've watched the Netflix documentary about David and Victoria Beckham. Well, when they got married in 1999, Elton John was there ready to sing and play at their wedding. And of course, the Spice Girls were on call, if you remember them. Imagine getting married and then at your reception, you can just casually ask 
Swift Taylor and Robbie Williams to do a duet, a duet uh, as the wedding cake is cut. Imagine being able to say, verse 10, Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I refused my heart no pleasure. Wine, women, song, all the pleasures of life he grasped at. But still, he's found wanting. He's telling us, you see, what so many people don't believe, but it's so true and proven over and over and over again that pleasure will always hold out the promise of purpose and satisfaction in life, but it doesn't deliver and it doesn't last. In the end, this road, this pursuit, this experiment by the teacher turns out to be empty, elusive, ephemeral, fleeting, like vapour, like a bubble about to float away and burst and is no more. Now, it's not that the pleasure is not pleasurable. It's just that the more you chase after it, the more it seems to disappear and leave you found wanting even more. See, the teacher wants to be a pleasure seeker, but he can never be a pleasure keeper until he discovers the paradox of pleasure. The more you seek it, the less you have. So think about it. Spend your life drinking and the next drink never really satisfies. The alcoholic never appreciates a good drop of red from Brown Brothers. Take a harmless drug to pick you up. Well, eventually you'll get bored and need to try something harder and deadlier. Have sex with multiple partners. Eventually you'll be bored and be found, in, and be found wanting more and more. Race out and buy the latest iPhone or high-tech gadget. But soon it will be outdated, outmoded. The battery life will be shot and you'll be hanging out for the next gadget to come along. Watch Fast and Furious movie number 48 and you'll be bored and then you can't wait for Fast and Furious number 49 just to keep you entertained. American author Greg Easterbrook wrote a book once called The Prog the Progress Paradox. It was subtitled, How Life Gets Better While People Feel Worse. And his basic premise is that we have more of almost everything today except happiness. The more we have, the unhappier we seem to be because we know that we'll never be able to get all the new things that we want. Cheryl Crow uh, released a song back in 1996. It'll be forgotten, of course, as Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 11 reminds us. But she asked the question in the song, If it makes you happy, it can't be that bad. If it makes you happy, then why the hell are you so sad? Well, perhaps she also had Ecclesiastes open. It doesn't take much to see now that in 2024, here in Western society, that we are surrounded by 2 Timothy 3 verse 4 people, that is, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and where everything is offered to us and it seems that nothing is unavailable. Hugh Jackman and Zac Efron star in the 2017 hit movie The Greatest Showman. There's a song in the movie with the lyrics, Towers of gold are still too little, these hands could hold the world, but it'll never be enough. And then here's Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I was king over Israel, and I could have every pleasure under the sun. Surely then I would find satisfaction, meaning, purpose, joy in this life. But in the end, it all proved meaningless. Well, so far the teacher in Ecclesiastes has gone two rounds in the ring of life. He searched and sought after meaning and purpose and satisfaction from two areas of life. He studies human wisdom. Let me enroll in yet another university course. But he's been found wanting, even though his head is full of knowledge. And then he pursues pleasure. Let me go down to the pub and listen to the piano man. And then I'll go to the movies. And then I'll play the next computer game online with a mate in Mongolia I've never met. And then I'll hit the casino. And then I'll see who I can pick up. And then I'll go to the hotel pool tomorrow and sip martinis while getting a massage from a Swedish sumo wrestler. Uh, but this too finds him wanting more and more and more. I can't get no 
satisfaction. Remember back to chapter 1, we heard the line, the eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. So, so far, the teacher in Ecclesiastes is just confirming this truth. But he's also reminding us of the New Testament dangers of 1 John chapter 2, verse 26, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. If only he had read Psalm 119, verse 37, he would have saved a lot of time and a lot of trouble. There the psalmist prays, Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. But here in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, the teacher ignores God's warning completely. Whenever his eyes spied something he wanted, he simply took it. Whenever he was tempted to indulge in any pleasure, he simply did it. And in many ways, he's just reminding us of how the Bible story starts with hedonism rising to the surface. Remember, as Eve chooses to eat the forbidden fruit, we read, The woman saw the fruit was good and pleasing to the eye, a delight. So she took and ate and gave some to her husband. Well, here in Ecclesiastes, the teacher also sees, delights and takes. There was nothing he denied himself. The pathway to pleasure was his superhighway. All in the search of meaning, purpose, satisfaction. All in the search of the answer to why go on living. He is truly, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, he is truly the wanderer. Well, the teacher seeks and searches for meaning and purpose in human wisdom and then in every pleasure under the sun, but it's never ever going to work out until along comes one greater than Solomon who offers us a better answer, a better solution, a better pathway than what we find in Ecclesiastes. And it's not until we submit our lives, our ears, our our eyes, our senses, our desires, it's not until we seek and search for meaning under the sun, S-O-N, do we find that better answer and solution and pathway. Friends, we need a better way than what the teacher offers us here in Ecclesiastes. We need, again, to hear from another teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, who tells us, if you want to find meaning and purpose and satisfaction in life, then put me at the centre. Not human wisdom, not pleasures, but seek first the things of Jesus, the Son, And then life will begin to make sense and you'll find ultimate satisfaction. And that's why only in the gospel does St. Augustine's famous line make complete sense, where he writes, Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Our unsatisfied longings give us a spiritual restlessness reminding us that we were made for much more than pleasure-seeking in this life. Our dissatisfaction with life, even after chasing every kind of pleasure, should point us back to God. If what the teacher finds is true, that all the pleasures under the sun cannot satisfy our souls, then we need to look beyond this world, above the sun, to the sun in heaven. C.S. Lewis puts it brilliantly when he writes, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. For reading this early stage of Ecclesiastes, even now, we need to reach for our Jesus glasses, our gospel glasses, in order to see that a different kind of pleasure will only help us make sense of life. A different kind of searching is needed to bring meaning and purpose and satisfaction and true joy. But a clear reading of the New Testament with Ecclesiastes open next to us shows us that God is never anti-pleasure. God's not like some sort of cosmic killjoy, a heavenly scrooge, this divine spoil sport. Never can you arrive at that conclusion after reading the New Testament. For in the Gospel, God is never about taking pleasure away, but rather giving us a deeper, richer, more fulfilling pleasure than all the hedonistic dreams this world can throw at you and me. For once we learn to find our ultimate satisfaction in God himself, that is, in trusting our lives to Jesus, 
then and only then do we truly appreciate these three key New Testament verses. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, with a reference to 1 Timothy 4, verse 4. So whatever you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And finally, John 10, verse 10b, where Jesus speaks, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. For these three verses, help us make sense of Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and the pleasure-seeking life. For they tell us, firstly, God richly blesses us with gifts to enjoy in this life. And we'll revisit this theme again across this book. Secondly, that the best and truest pleasures are found in using the gifts that God gives for his honour and glory. Or in the words of 1 Timothy 4.4, consecrated by the word of God and by prayer. And thirdly, these three verses tell us that in following Jesus and his ways, you will have greatest, uh, the greatest satisfaction and joy than even King Solomon had with all the wine, women and song he grasped at. For you've been given in the gospel life to the full, life to the max. You see, we need, a, we need to have a good theology of work, but at the same time we need a good theology of rest and leisure and even pleasure. And it's by living under the Son, S-O-N, do we truly learn to glorify God and enjoy Him forever and then enjoy the gifts on offer from His creation as His creatures. It's Solomon's dad, King David, who also once put pen to parchment when he writes Psalm 16, verse 11. Speaking to God, he says, You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. It really is a promise pointing us to heaven. But John 10 verse 10 also reminds us that we begin to taste and see and experience heavenly pleasures right now. So friends, with this gospel framework in mind, with your Jesus glasses on, enjoy your wine or beer or spirits or cordial and drink for his glory and drink with thankfulness, not drunkenness, but with delightfulness. And enjoy your woman or man, singular, in your marriage covenant, and delight in the pleasures God gives. And enjoy your song, spiritual or secular, yes, every good and perfect gift from us is from above. And dance for joy, because he's put a new song in your heart, which you and I can sing for all eternity. Until next time, stop being the wanderer and rest in the joy of Jesus. Thanks for listening to Meals for Maturity. Keep growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ.